So here we are back in um, the second part of First Thessalonians, and this was uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, and he wrote, this was his very first letter. This was like 12 to 15 years after his conversion, after you know, spending time growing in the Lord. So it's not like he just came to the Lord and just, you know, wrote this letter. He had been serving in the kingdom for quite some time. And he had traveled through Thessalonica. And he missed the brothers and sisters that came to know Jesus while he was there. And so he wrote this letter. And we know that uh, it was somewhere, like I said, more than a dozen years after he um, actually was visited by Jesus on the road to Damascus and gave his life to Christ. And so here we are in chapter three, where we left off last week in chapter two, the final verses were um, written by Paul for we wanted to come to you. Indeed, I, Paul, tried again and again. But Satan obstructed us. And we know that the adversary does the same thing in our lives. And we also know that the Holy Spirit might stop us or push us in a certain direction. So we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and with, with powers and, and forces and, and some dark and some light places. That's our lives in Christ. And we need to accept that, embrace that, and really Seek wisdom and knowledge from the Lord so we can grow and learn in that. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He says, Satan obstructed us. Well, after all, who is our hope, our joy, our crown of boasting? If it is not yourselves, and now he's boasting and bragging on the church in Thessalonica because they were really true believers who were following Jesus, and they were seeking to be in his will. So he's boasting about them now, and he says, and he boasted, uh, if not in yourselves, in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. So now he's even talking about the coming of the Lord. This is first century. This is many years after Jesus already ascended uh, into uh, heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And uh, it's interesting because in the podcast, they'll put, the Lord put that on my heart. Hey, guess what? A lot of people out there think that the body of Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. But the body of Christ is at work right here on earth. He continued his earthly ministry beyond the power of the Holy Spirit during Pentecost. And up to today, the Holy Spirit is what lives within us, and we are his body if we are in Christ. So his body and his earthly ministry continues. And um, so we don't know when the Lord's coming back. And Paul kind of thought it could be close. And this is in the first century. And he says, you are indeed our glory and our joy. So he continues in chapter three and says, so we could bear it no longer. We were willing to be left on our own in Athens. So we sent Timothy, our brother and fellow worker for God in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. In other words, you go ahead. You go ahead. We're still working here. But Timothy, you, we just can't wait any longer. You go and encourage those brothers and sisters in Thessalonica so that none of you would be shaken by these trials. In other words, they knew he was suffering and they were starting to wonder, is he ever going to come? Is, is he going to be okay? And he sent Timothy. For you know that we were destined for this. He told them ahead of time that he was going to suffer. And he said, you're going to suffer too. So indeed, when we were with you, we kept warning you that we would suffer persecution. But as you know, it has come to pass. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to, to find out about your faith. I needed to know, were you still following Jesus? He needed to know that. And he says, he had a fear that the tempter, that same Satan, the same adversary, had somehow tempted you and caused our labor to be in vain. Remember when Jesus talked about the sower and how some seeds were planted, but they never took root because the devil would come and snatch them away. Paul feared that. Paul feared even that some of them 
who were very, very motivated and zealous at first, had kind of walked away from the path. And he also feared that maybe some of them over a period of time had become troubled and, and that the adversary had caused things in their lives that they completely walked away. So he feared that. He wanted to know. He sends Timothy ahead. And it says, but just now Timothy has returned from his visit with good news about your faith. He's excited. Your love and the fond memories that you have preserved, longing to see us just as we long to see you. What a beautiful thing it is when we who are in Jesus get together and we long just as much as the others long to meet together. Not for social reasons, not because, wow, it's so great, I can't wait to tell somebody this or tell somebody that. I know I had a lot of that in my life. But for us just to see one another and share what Christ means to us with one another. To encourage someone who says, you know what, I had a really bad day yesterday and I needed prayer. To be able to be so in tune with Christ that when we come together, we feel his spirit moving among us. Uh, that's what Paul was feeling here, and that's what they were. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we have been reassured about you because of your faith. What a beautiful encouragement. For now, we can go on living. It's like Paul said, Ooh, the, the pressure's off, the burden's gone. As long as you are standing firm in the Lord, how can we adequately thank God for you in return for our great joy over you in his presence. Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking from your faith, to be used by the Lord to teach, to disciple, to help them grow spiritually. This is what Paul's talking about. He says, and, and now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, trusting in the will of the Lord, knowing he'll direct them. And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone else, just as our love for you overflows, so that he may establish your hearts in blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. Amen. So he's once again feeling as though Jesus could return at any moment. In chapter four, he continues, finally, brothers, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus to live in a way that is pleasing to God. That's what our desire is, to live in a way that's pleasing to God, just as you have received from us. This is how you already live. So you should do it all the more. In other words, be encouraged. Don't stop. Keep going. For you know the instructions that we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For it is God's will that you could be holy. You must abstain from sexual immorality. Each of you must know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. And no one should ever violate or exploit, exploit his brother in this regard. There's so much that goes on in what's called today's church, where it's so exploited, where somebody with who's a, a rock star, a worship leader, or um, a eloquent speaker uh, falls, and, and the adversary uses those things and there's all kinds of sexual abuse going on. And it doesn't, you don't have to look very far to find it. And it's everywhere around the world. He's he's warning them of this. This was in the first century. And he says, now about brotherly love. You do not need anyone to write to you. He knows that they know. And he goes on and says, because you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. That is the work of the Spirit because God is love. And you are indeed showing this love for all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to excel more and more who aspire to live 
quietly. To attend to your own matters. Don't be gossips and busybodies. Don't start pointing the finger at somebody else and judging them. And to work with your own hands. Don't sit around and expect somebody's going to go ahead and give you something. Don't live off of charity. But work with your own hands as we instructed you. Then you will behave properly towards outsiders without being dependent on anyone. See, the Lord wants us to be dependent on him. We want him to hold leverage over us. But this world teaches us that we want somehow or another to um, get things from other people, and then they hold leverage over us. And this is the way of the world. Brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So now he's telling them, some of you have died, but we don't want you to be ill-informed about them so that you will not grieve like the rest who are without hope. Because we know, it's it's not no irony that today when I was sharing in the uh, podcast that uh, we go to a funeral and what's the first thing we hear is that every person that I've ever been to is up in heaven looking down on us and they're all good to go with God. We don't know that. People are offering these false signals and and then people start wondering. Paul's reassuring them. You know, if they were in Christ, don't worry about it. But since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So if you are in Christ and you die, we can rest assured that we will be together again. By the word of the Lord, we declare to you that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. So it's not like we're going to get there before them. Don't worry. God's got, got this, and they're already okay. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will be the first to rise. After that, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. When we say goodbye to one another each time we meet, I always share, I'll see you either here, which hoping the next time we meet together, I'll see you maybe there, which is in heaven, or I'll see you in the air. And that's what Paul's talking about right here. Because when the Lord comes back, he is going to bring up the dead who have died before us and catch them up in the clouds as well as us, and we'll all be caught up together. That takes us into the final chapter of uh, Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. Now, about the times and season, brothers, we do not need to write to you. You are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, everybody knows what a thief in the night is like, because when we're not aware, somebody comes in and they pillage and they take our stuff, and we're none the wiser because we're sleeping. While people are saying peace and security, destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in the darkness, so that this day should overtake you like a thief. You are in the light, he's telling them, for you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness, so then let us not sleep as the others do. He's telling them to be awake, to watch. But let us remain awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope and salvation. For God has not appointed us to suffer wrath. If you are in Christ, you will not see the wrath of God. But if you are not in Christ, you will suffer the wrath of God. But he ha he says that we are appointed to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, 
we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage and build one another up just as you are already doing. But we ask, brothers, to acknowledge those who work diligently among you, who preside over you in the Lord and give you instruction. In love, put them in the highest regard because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brothers, who admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak and be patient with everyone. Make sure that no one repays evil for evil. Always pursue what is good for one another and for all the people. For your brothers and sisters in Christ and for those who aren't in Christ, always seek what is good. Rejoice at all times. Boy, we don't do enough of that. We like to grumble at times. We do. It's human for us. But he says, rejoice at all times. Pray without ceasing. Wait a second. I can't pray all the time. I'll tell you, the, the closer my relationship with Jesus, the more I find that it doesn't matter where I am or when I am. I can just say, okay, Lord, help me with this one. Or, whoop, I blew that one. Help me, Lord, out of this mess. And he's right there. That's praying without ceasing. You have that relationship with him. And it says, um, to give thanks in every circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And many of you I could mention by name who have been through circumstances that most people in this world would trust God for have given thanks because you know that it drew you closer in your relationship with Jesus. Do not extinguish the spirit. They sometimes call this quenching the spirit. The spirit wants to be alive in you. The power of God is the only power. We don't have any power in this world, but the power of God that comes through the spirit of Jesus that lives within us. Do not treat prophecy with contempt, but test all things because not every prophet is true. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, how many times has he mentioned about the coming of the Lord here? The church in Thessalonica was waiting for the Lord. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Who calls us? If it's not Jesus Christ, he's the one who called us. We didn't choose him. He chose us. He called us. Brothers, pray for us as well. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord, have this letter read to all the brothers. Take it to everyone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that was Paul's first letter that he wrote. He was excited. He didn't know exactly what he was going to write, but he wanted to encourage his brothers and sisters that were living in Thessalonica. And this was his letter. Now, he mentioned a few things there, like a thief in the night. Well, we can learn from the parable of the ten virgins what he was talking about. Jesus was the one who gave us this in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. When Jesus taught, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Well, naturally, you have to know who the bridegroom is, and you have to be waiting for him in order to be considered one of the virgins. So there are ten of them, and they were waiting for their bridegroom. Five of them, though, became very foolish, and five were very wise. The foolish ones, well, they took their lamps, but they didn't take any extra oil. So they may have had something, but guess what? They didn't have all it took. They didn't have any oil in their lamps. And this says they took along extra oil. But the wise ones, they took oil in flasks along with their lamps. But when the bridegroom was delayed, 
oh, wait a second, he's not here yet. When's he coming? I don't know when he's coming. You know what? We're supposed to be ready. Okay, well, I've got my lamp with me and I'm all set. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. All of them, whether they were wise or whether they were foolish, they all fell asleep because they were waiting on the bridegroom, but he hadn't come. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here is the bridegroom about to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and they trimmed their lamps. They went ahead and, and got ready because they were going to light the way to the bridegroom's back to the bridegroom's home. That's what they did. The bridegroom would come, receive his bride, and then all the way on the way to the bridegroom's house where he built place for them on his home. They would light the way because it was in the middle of the night. It was midnight. It was at an hour they didn't expect. And so they all trimmed their lamps. Well, the foolish one said to the wise, hey, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are, go are going out. So they weren't going to make it to that mansion because they didn't have enough oil. So it says, um, they asked for oil to be given to them, and the wise one said no. Or there may not be enough for both of you and us to make it to our mansion, to make it to the bridegroom's home. So they said, instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy it, the bridegroom arrived. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins arrived and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. We've got our lamps. We had to go get some more oil. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore, Jesus tells us to keep watch. Because you do not know the day or the hour. Well, express that to the Thessalon Thessalonians. And guess what? They were waiting and waiting. We're going to find when we get to Second Thessalon Thessalonians next week that, ooh, this was a big point that came up. Because somebody creeps in after Paul had spent time with them and shared with them that they had missed the Lord, but they were foolish virgins, not wise. And that information gets back to Paul, and he needs to write him another letter. And so we'll cover that next week. But looking back at what Jesus was saying here, we need to be ready. We need to be following Jesus every day. What a shame it is for us who make the assumption, no, I think I've already followed him long enough and I'm still going to heaven to maybe knock on that door and say, hey, Lord, where are you? And have his voice say, where, where were you? And not make it in. We have a personal relationship with Christ and we need to nurture that. And that's something each one of us needs to do individually every day. So that's what the Lord put on my heart to to share with you concerning uh, Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica.